Anybody can guess what is the aspect? Uh, obviously, here the view is a little bit different. But okay, who, uh, residents from the Brazilian society visiting here, can you raise your hand? Okay. Okay, brasileiro na sala, raise your hand. Okay, you can pick any resident, Nima. Okay, uh, right there, in the front. You can you can oh. pick on Ryan too if you want. <laughs> You're it, Ryan. You, you got you got anywhere from zero to ten. Just pick a number. <laughs> I will go a little higher number. Seven. Okay. Uh, anybody else? So uh, it's a little hard because obviously in the actual picture you can window it up and down a little bit. I look, usually look at the basal ganglia, posterior limb, internal capsule. Um, I don't know. The posterior limb is pretty spare. Uh, the basal ganglia looks really good. If you look really, really close, maybe here compared to the other side, maybe there's a little bit of loss of gray and white differentiation. But it's very hard. I give an aspect of nine. Um, but then here's a rapid. So we talked about it this morning. Uh, doc, did we lose Dr. Albers? Okay. I was hoping I can quiz him on this. Um, so here's his rapid um, uh, for everybody who may not know on so, the right. So Nima, let's see normal 5 a.m. and now is what? 8 a.m.? Six, six, uh, six, uh, uh, so 60 six, minutes. So one hour from symptoms on side. So one hour from onset, here's a core, 135 cc. Here's the uh, penumbra, 197. It gives you about 62 cc mismatch. Dr. Feller here? Feller here? No. Okay, so the question obviously becomes this patient has M1 occlusion, high NIH. What do you guys want to do? Ryan. Oh, Ryan? <laughs> uh, so here, here, man. So going back to the CT, um, you know, all the sulci are faced, and, you know, I would say there's lots of gray-white differentiation there. Um, but so if you go to the what, rapid... What would you do aspect-wise? Just curious. I'd say it's probably four. Four? four. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then go to the rapid. Uh, so here, this is, uh, I will tell you with the caveat, we don't use CT perfusion. Um, we use multi-phase CTA, but based on this, if you believe that this core is 135 cc's, I would say this is probably not a, patient's probably not a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. That said, based on that CT result um, and that aspects, we would quickly, we have an MRI in our uh, okay. emergency room. We just grab a quick DWI sure. to confirm. I think M MRI is uh, very reasonable. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Dr. Uh, so I'm just going to show a couple more pictures here before I... I thought you were going to ask a radiologist for his aspects, but uh, I'm not suggesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just curious. As, uh, I would love to go over the aspect with you because, I don't know, aspect of four. Sir, uh, it's hard not to put you on to, the uh, spot. Well, I, I, I mean, there is mass effect and there is sulcal effacement, but I, I don't see, I guess, I try to err on the side of not overcalling, so I might have actually given it a 10. I'm sorry, what would you say? I might have given it a 10. Oh, really? Okay. All right. All right. But I'm, I'm there's just quite glad a bit of variability, so, so of far variability off. obviously. <laughs> Inter-observer inter reliability, <laughs> reliability of aspects uh, uh, by my young Goyal. <laughs> Why it's so uh, valuable. Yes. Um, you're in the magic hour, though, right? Yes. Magic, magic hour. You're in the magic hour. Yeah. So I, I think the uh, stroke volume may not be as large as what uh, CT perfusion is telling us based on what we uh, heard today and have read in the literature. So I agree a DWI would be really helpful to help you decide what the true core volume um, is. Perfect. Uh, one problem I have with the DWI in this hyperacute setting is this patient, obviously, we know is a rapid progressor. Um, quick DWI would be great, but I mean, that's another 15 to 20 minutes at least. Um, there's another thing that rapid gives us, which I was hoping Dr. Albers would expand on it. Um, in the hyperacute setting, you can also look at the cerebral blood flow. So the traditional one is uh, less than 30% of the contralateral side, but you can actually look at the less than 20%. And I think if you look at the um, other values, maybe there is more better way of looking at the core in a hyperacute setting. This is the volume, by the way, because since we talked about it this morning. 
Okay, so anybody wants to take this patient to for a thrombectomy, no thrombectomy, uh, TPA, no TPA, uh, Dr. Hanno? Yes, for both. Yes. Any, anybody says no? Okay, we move on. Uh, patient obviously had poor collaterals, by the way, right on one occlusion. He did get IV TPA. Obviously, I was, I was on, so I took the patient. Um, M1 occlusion opened up. Uh, if you look at the lateral, it is TK3. Uh, so it was successful recanalization. Um, two passes, so nothing too bad. And here's the final MRI. Um, I think that um, when you look at the MRI, the, the, obviously the basal ganglia is spared, as you can see, but obviously this right here is the infarcted area. Um, if you look at the, the map that I showed you, I think it's following more close to the volume of less than 20% than 30%, because I think that we still uh, saved area of the brain based on, um, based on rapid. Uh, do you guys agree? Yeah, I, I, again, I struggle with this. And uh, again, Mark Ribo coined this term and he beat us to the punchline publishing this as goal score. We've seen patients with this large call by rapid stroke. And again, uh, Carl's going to, is Carl here? Here. Carl, I'm going to share that. Carl, he's going to talk to you. Carl Shank uh, had a 90cc core on the rapid with an 8cc core on the WI. So uh, we know that everything that we do is not perfect science. And I think this one, the matching was better. But in some cases, there, especially as, as Kevin was pointing out on the early window, uh, I, I think uh, – you, you'd be surprised that you see cores that are much, much smaller. And uh, I think it's, uh, we don't throw the towel anymore, right, Nemo, with a, with a CTP-based yeah. decision. Yeah, so I think as a group, we decided in hyper acute setting, um, we're going to look at the M1 occlusion, clinical deficit and aspect. And we get the perfusion still. I think it's great value, but I think uh, we should not use that just to exclude patients. How did um, this patient do? So an edge of three or four, depending on some extinction, some sensory deficit. But interestingly, uh, just mild uh, drift. So actually he's going to rehab. So I think the patient is going to do well. If you look back, uh, his cortical, um, uh, his uh, motor strip is spared and basal ganglia is spared. So um, overall, actually, he did better than his MRI. Clinically improved. Here, here, right. Better with a thrombectomy right. than without Right. So it's an example. That's that's your large core case. Right. Where right. a mechanical thrombectomy, but that aspect is for that patient benefit. Because uh, on the other flip, if you had got your DWI, if you had got your DWI, and this probably would have been your DWI, then would you take the patient? Yeah. Hopefully our future study is going to answer that question. Uh, another thing that I, I think, uh, Ryan, I don't know, since you guys do MRI, and I've seen this a lot from France, is reversible, reversible DWI. I think, I think we all have seen this now that you see this DWI, reopen the vessel and that disappears. So uh, that's another one I think is hard uh, on the early window. I understand what, what Greg told us earlier, but like Mr. Clean is a positive trial. So, so if you have a good aspect, means six. Yeah, exactly. So Dr. Albers uh, actually is here now. So um, Dr. Albers, one hour from onset, high NIH. Oh, here. here you go. <laughs> I was looking for you. Sorry, I know you just came back. Just, but. just to pick up on the reversible DWI, we've seen a lot of that when you image within the first 24 hours. When you reperfuse, the ADC goes up. But in the vast majority of these cases, if you wait a couple of days and take another picture, it, come, it returns. Back. So it's really transient reversal rather than permanent. In Diffuse 2, we only had two cases that had permanent reversal of the diffusion. And we had a case uh, just a year ago where a patient had their stroke on the MRI scanner. They went in with no stroke. They actually occluded their right MCA on the scanner. They had this huge diffusion lesion. And of course, we went immediately to thrombectomy. And after the case, which was a quick twig key three, we took another picture. The diffusion lesion was completely gone. You know, we were celebrating. And then a couple of days later, it's back. The patient still did well. And these infarcts are not all or none. So it's often patchy. 
So, you know, certainly we, we like to be aggressive on, on early cases, but the permanent diffusion reversal, if you wait, it, it's not very common. Right, so once, once we can see that the ADC has really dropped low, it's quite unusual to have permanent reversal. But you were, the question you were asking me about uh, a case with a, it, can you say the case again? Oh, oh no, this is the case. So it's a 62 year old with a high NIH on one hour from onset. Uh, what would you do? You know, we're, we're quite aggressive within an hour. You've got a little bit of mismatch, and we always try to look at, you know, where the mismatch is. Is it in critically important areas? Because for, for trials, we go by volume. For patients, we try to go by wh where is the salvageable tissue. If they're coming in with an aphasia, and it looks like there's salvageable tissue in Broca's area, or if they've got their motor strip still salvageable, we tend to be aggressive. We have taken cases like this, and uh, particularly in the older folks, we have frequently wished that we hadn't, but uh, mm -hmm. be interesting to hear what happened with this one. So um, um, I was talking about the volume and I did show the uh, CBF of less than 20% as well. So this patient uh, went for thrombectomy, uh, so TK3, and this was the final infarct volume. Um, and, uh, and the question to you was, um, I think we had talked about this before, at least you and I, uh, I, I think with this hyperacute setting, I wonder if the cerebral flow of 20% is more indicative of the core rather than the 30%. Yeah, so for, for an MRI, an MRI scan, uh, you know, we're going to go based on the diffusion lesion, and we, we normally like to go with the ADC for that because if the ADC is less than 620, uh, what we've seen from previous studies is 99% of the pixels with an ADC less than 620, if you re-image by five days, they're incorporated into the infarct. So again, that permanent reversal is very rare. If this was a CT perfusion, it was an MR, right, that you showed? Or was it a CTP? Right, that was if it's a CTP. If it's a CTP, uh, we're, we're using 20% uh, in the first hour, and it's based on relatively so, limited data. So you are using 20%. Yeah, and it was just looking over your data at lunch, mm -hmm. and you have two cases out of 30 within the first hour who there's major uh, ghost core, right? That, the, that there was an infarct volume that was substantially smaller than your baseline CTP at, at 30%. And then you've got about, uh, you know, another six or seven cases where it's about 15 ml smaller. So it's not a huge amount of, of ghost core. Uh, we, we found up to half of the cases we scanned within an hour using the 20%, uh, using the 30%, they had some ghost core. But then when we go down to 20%, we didn't have anybody with ghost core. So our, our practice is to use 20% within the golden hour. But again, to be quite aggressive if there's appears to be salvageable tissue in a clinically relevant area. But, but, but the software is, is not giving us that automatic. Like you've got to go to the, sub, the, the other maps, not on the primary map. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's just the third map that comes through that gives you the 20%. If you want to set your, uh, your, your software to give you 20 and 30% on the mismatch map, you can easily do that and you get two volumes. We don't do that because it can confuse people. And, you know, the, the golden hour patients, uh, at least at most centers, are pretty rare. I mean, when we were developing Rapid over the years, we rarely saw that. And then it's just been in the last couple of years that we're starting to see these people getting scanned within an hour. Here. So, uh, uh, Dimitris Lopes is saying maybe with the mobile CT uh, that uh, some uh, very fortunate cities like Chicago have, uh, maybe you're going to see more of this. Very good. Thank you. Uh, this patient did well. Um, I'm going to go over this case for uh, sake of time. Similar case, a younger patient came in with um, uh, right hemispheric stroke. This was the uh, CT perfusion. Again, uh, within an hour and 15 minutes from onset, um, similar situation, uh, went for a thrombectomy, had ICA terminus, and this patient also did relatively well, went back home. Okay, so a little bit of change of talk. Go. Oh, we, we are, we're live streaming, Dr. Lopez, we need to use the microphone. Thank you. Um, uh, by the way, logo and neurovascular for exchange. <laughs> so the, um, I think the main issue is um, what would be the collateral Core. Just for the sake of discussion, these two cases, uh, I looked re poor, really bad. I, I don't know if you. Uh, it's an interesting question, two ways. One is that uh, 
sides that are still looking at collaterals and how many should even on thrombectomy time uh, look around before you do the thrombectomy, which is a practice that personally I don't do. I'll go directly to the target vessel, but some of my colleagues actually do an angiogram to assess collaterals. And, um, I'm, is a question and a comment. I think looking at the collateral is obviously another part of the formula that we use. And I personally like looking at the collateral. And the angiogram is a little hard. I mean, if you take the patient, angio, you can definitely look at the collateral, but are you not going to do anything just because based on angio support collateral? So I think that becomes a little challenging. Um, okay, so change of gear. 30-year-old with um, coronary disease, uh, with right side of weakness and some problem with speech. I had left uh, hemispheric stroke on MRI. This is the carotid, uh, this is a CTA, which showing on the A, the basically the um, area of hypotensity and plaque uh, with some intraluminal thrombus right there and here. And um, how would you guys manage this patient? Dr. Lopez. Uh, so let's go back one slide. Sure. I didn't show the MRI, but there was a small stroke. Um, patient had an NIH of like two or three. Okay. And um, just uh, curiosity, was there any idea of uh, uh, time this patient shows up with a coronary, coronary, coronary artery disease, right side weakness? Yeah, this was within um, same day. So this happened suddenly, patient presented. Um, did not get any acute therapy. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, I think just to review the whole thing, normally uh, it's a very young patient. You come in, you have, I uh, assume here, uh, and I stroke here, there's relevant uh, high level. Oh, in, uh, two or three. Just oh, some low. So it's a low, low NIH. NIH yes. Okay. Uh, and then. Demetrius, this, this is a symptomatic carotid stenosis. Right. So sorry, this is more like a no, secondary no large vessel no, Okay, that's what I was trying to get to. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, so th this is a patient that... To, we tend to treat early with a low NIH. But, uh, but this patient came in, I think NIH was like two or three, um, was outside of the window for TPA. Um, intracranial was open, so patient was admitted to the ICU. I think the question, to the symptomatic carotid, uh, uh, how would you approach the secondary prevention for this symptomatic carotid? So, uh, uh, Intraluminal thrombus, do you yeah. anticoagulate and then intervene or angioplast in a stent or in direct direct? Well, I think that the, um, if there was a question, if there's a patient that is fluctuating symptoms, I tend to think that this could be clot on that area or have a high burden of clot. Usually they have a lot of waxing, waning symptoms going worse. Uh, those, uh, I have to say, there is a rationale to give them the heparinization if the stroke volume is not large and, and, and kind of wait for that. But we tend to go early on on these lesions, uh, assuming that, uh, uh, especially if there is a hemodynamic significant stenosis, uh, and avoid a second event from happening, uh, especially with a low stroke volume like this. So uh, stenting versus a direct rectum in your so, thoughts with this is small interluminal thrombus? Yeah, if, if, if it's, I think, uh, a patient that has low uh, cardiac risk, we tend to go in direct me. If it's a patient that has no con complications, um, contraindications in their direct me, then we'll just fire stenting. Uh, Dr. Filler? So I would actually, I would love to see picture of the brain. So do, do we have actual uh, indications for hemodynamic? No, just a pattern? couple of hits. Sorry, again, I don't have the MRI. Just imagine three DWI hits uh, on the left posterior frontal lobe. In a normal small. city. Okay. So small embolic infarct. Right. Okay. So hmm, it, it's really hard for me to understand if this is a floating thrombus. If it is, I would go for end arteriectomy. If it's not, stenting why 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 waiting because it needed to be treated anyway so no no problem with that and the infarct seems to be small so no problem with anti-aggregation dr savage so it's always interesting to me so uh, again obviously this appear i think in the possibility it's intraluminal thrombus it was brought out i i feel sometimes as the field moving we forget that there's a lot of people who you know, look about some of the disease we're treating quite a bit. 
So if you look at the mineral carotid thrombus, you know, I feel sometimes in the endovascular field that there's this sense, and, and again, not for acute event, but for like a symptomatic event, patient who is stable, I feel there is urgency that the clot needs to come out, and because we have balloon and all that, we could take it out. But I mean, if you look at NASET, if you look at all the carotid study was done, was clearly, uh, clearly documented that this is a period that patients are at high risk of embolic event for endarterectomy or for endovascular therapy. So an apparent works really well. The love series has been done, you know, more historically. So uh, nobody mentioned that. Is it something that you guys would consider? Or? I, I, obviously, I, if the patient's fluctuating, I mentioned that uh, it's not uh, those cases I do worry, or a C-sile, you know, when you get there, there's this thing moving in the carotid artery. Then you have to make a decision. Today, different than acid and all that, we have to put the, the flow reverse. So we have other techniques that they just didn't deploy in those trials. And I think that the, our imaging is better too. So maybe we're getting more information and knowing where you, you go. If you're going to go in this thinking as a plaque every time or a plaque with clots and you don't have that knowledge, I think you can get in high complication rates. But the more you have that concern, like you brought it up, I think it's very reasonable that you prepare yourself. And I think it can be handled different than the numbers and asset. Of course, you discussed with a randomized trial now, but I'm just saying that there, time has lapsed and that, that, that knowledge on those cases, I think, was different than what we have today and the techniques, too, and the vices. Yeah, but we know that the natural history on people in heparin is pretty benign. I mean, obviously, they need to be revascularized on the road, but we know that acutely it's pretty benign. You know, I keep saying that. I live in constant fear that one day we'll have imaging <laughs> to look at benign perimesencephalic subarachnoid hemorrhage and we'll found what caused the bleeding, and we'll decide that it's probably a good idea now because we know better and try to fix that. So I feel sometimes we try to reinvent things because we have technology that is available, but there is a treatment paradigm for that that is quite safe. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Uh, the issue for me is a little bit of the uncertainty. Are you sure every time that you have a clot, you know, what, what gives you the assurance that is it because he has no other disease, it's a young patient has, you know, no, no atherosclerosis anywhere else, and that's why you think it has to be a clot, or what is the certainty you have that you're going to be right and just using heparin in this case? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's very into the discussion. Again, we had uh, Dr. Spatzer, he's a visiting professor not long ago, and we both trained under him. We, we show him a case like this. I would never put this patient on heparin. He said, we thought we'd train with you. We thought that's what we would do. He said, no, I wouldn't do that. And then Nick Hopkins is the opposite. I'm not going to operate in dark terrectomy in somebody with an internal tackle with an asset number. So, Kevin, if you look at this, what is that sitting? And this guy, unfortunately, uh, did not show up for his uh, uh, MP Rage MRI. That's what <laughs> we're trying to get him to. So he left the hospital before that. But uh, what do you see here on the CAT scan? So it's a really interesting study, and, and you, got a, you have this large soft tissue plaque um, component, and you're also able to appreciate the, some of the dark areas. So this absolutely could be uh, clot and you know, ulceration, free-floating thrombus. The question you have to ask is, why does a 30-year-old have atherosclerotic disease? So this is, is this the edge of the plaque here? Because that's what I read on this. Yes, and I think you can see it even more clearly in this plane. Yes. So, you know, the, the interesting question is why does this person have such advanced atherosclerotic disease in such a young age? But that's exactly how I would uh, interpret this. Excellent. So for sake of time, um, so this patient actually was uh, placed on heparin drip. <laughs> actually, no, uh, no. to be fair, this no, was... No, actually, I was on call, yeah, yeah, and actually, we do exactly the same. Actually, as a group, I think all three of us uh, would do the same thing. But yeah, no, actually, this was Dr. Hanel's patient, for full disclosure. <laughs> uh, heparin, drip, and aspirin. Uh, we usually do a delay, a few days, CTA, just see how things work. Got a CTA in two days, still same, pretty much similar thing. Patient really wanted to go home because of his work reason, um, and then follow up CTA in two weeks. Is so, so this guy said, doctor, I, I cannot afford to be here a week on Happen. I need to go home. I'm the only person that brings bread to my table. And if I don't work, my whole family suffers. It's a day by day 
deal at my home. I need to go home. I cannot stay. I'll promise that I'll come back. <laughs> uh, so two weeks later, on the right side of the screen, you see this follow-up CTA, um, uh, which shows the resolution of the problem. These patients always make you really nervous, but we've followed a number of them too. And we don't use heparin because there's no randomized data that says heparin is better than dual antiplatelet or single antiplatelet. In every single randomized heparin trial ever done, the results have been negative. Well, so we, we would, you know, if we're going to watch, we use antiplatelet agents rather than- In the hospital as well. Because we put them on heparin drip, but then de seed on aspirin plavix. But in yeah. the hospital in acute setting, yeah, I see. But yeah. there's no data for it. No heparin. data, no data. Okay, so the etiology of this, was this a rupture? A uh, plaque uh, that uh, thrombose in there, or this came from somewhere else? Because that's what bugs me about this. You know, like uh, whatever happened here, is this medical management going to take care of the source of this? Uh, I think what uh, Vermani showed this morning. I wish we could go and take this out. There's no indication for that at this point. Uh, but I think this is soft plaque erosion or rupture right there that exposed that. Did the plaque melt? In a week, probably not. There was probably thrombus. And we all have done this in the arteriectomy case that you open there. All you have is a cystile organized thrombus and there's no stenosis. You resect the thrombus, you can leave the, the artery uh, uh, intact. Uh, but I, it was pretty amazing. And I don't know if I have another case very similar. Uh, so unfortunately, I didn't show up. He had a, yeah. This is another case, 57-year-old, basically similar, similar picture. Uh, you can see on the um, right side, there's a plaque, soft plaque, thrombus. But, but it's very interesting what Kevin illustrated earlier today. You see the plaque, you see the edge of that. Yeah, no, you can, you can clearly see. And that's what's powerful is I used to say um, MR made me a better reader of CT, and this is kind of the same. You know, you, you, can, you can definitely start to understand where the lumen, uh, uh, sorry, where the adventitial uh, surface is, and especially when, not in a case like this, but when they're more complex, you tend to get a lot of adventitial calcifications, and that's because that's where a lot of the inflammation is happening. And the um, U University of Utah group uh, wrote um, about the crescent sign, and what it was was thin adventitial calcification is a big marker of inflammation and and Dr. Romani talked about that today as well. Yeah, no, I think you can outline the plaque pretty well. You just got to look for it. But once you look for it, it's there. So this patient, similar situation. And uh, this is a follow-up CTA in uh, 24 days. Uh, on the right side, again, the plaque is resolved. Well, what's pretty amazing on these two cases is how fast that uh, resolved. Because, again, you're showing a year, two years for uh, heavy statins therapy to work. This is a Three weeks, two weeks. Right. So that exactly tells you that's clot as opposed to all of the extensive atherosclerotic disease that we were uh, talking about. And I think you're right on both cases. That's, that's just amazing. This one had an MRI, right? MRI plaque imaging? Uh, I don't have it in the presentation. This one, but this one, Greg, had also, was not all hemorrhage. That was a big necrotic core that in, th in three weeks, it looks extensively improved. So that's, that's what is very interesting on this. Um, I guess we're out of time. I have one more case if you guys want to keep going or we're out of time. Um, well, I, I just wanted to show this case since we talked about it briefly this morning. 91-year-old, uh, by the way, Dr. Fuller, you presented this morning um, difficult access. How, what was the percentage of patient who were not able to, the clot was not able to be reached, 20%. I haven't looked at it in our database, but obviously we have some patients that we cannot get to. Um, it's, it's rare, but uh, this 91-year-old was one of those situations where it had a very difficult access. And um, as you can see, the problem that we deal with is, uh, it's kind of hard to see because the patient is moving, but uh, it's the arch right here keep uh, pushing everything down instead of going back up. And it's hard to see, but I do have a wire all the way up here. And um, so I was able to get distal, but no matter how I tried, I couldn't get the, um, the guide catheter into the carotid. And trust me, I struggled. Um, and uh, so in this situation, uh, I, I tried every device that we have available. So other than devices or approaches, 
uh, what else would you guys do for this 91 year old? High NIH, uh, high pre acute, I see a terminal seclusion at, at that time. Sorry. Radial. Yeah, I think radial is another, another good, uh, or alternative access, I think is a good approach. Um, this, was, um, this was a patient that we used the direct carotid puncture. And once we got into the carotid, uh, then obviously the rest of it was uh, pretty easy. Uh, we just used a six French, uh, five French, uh, it's a five French uh, adder lumen, but it's six French. And um, once we got there, we had no problem recanalizing. Um, we did publish uh, just seven patients, and um, these were all direct carotid puncture. And uh, one patient had a neck hematoma that required intubation, but uh, but the rest of the patients had mild hematoma, didn't cause any problems. Um, good. So that's a big question as to how, what would you do when you finish? Um, uh, subject to discussion. For this case, I just held manual pressure for 30 minutes uh, very carefully. I did intubate the patient before we punctured the product. I think here it's nice to bring up the TCAR experience because uh, what, uh, when you're doing this testing, the length between the clavicle to the bifurcation and the length of your sheath is kind of a big deal because you need to land that. You know, we don't have the perfect tools for this approach. And the T-car technique kind of developed all that for this and involves, of course, a direct closure afterwards. It takes a little bit more time to get access. But I do think uh, if, if we were to move into this, uh, I, I do think radio is growing. But if you go into this, to develop a set of tools that is more appropriate for this would make this so much easier. And then. I, I think the short radio sheet would, would uh, be the solution for that. Uh, here, one of our texts was saying even dialysis uh, catheters that they do a short port will be interesting for this, uh, but the radio a little shorty, so you don't have to do with that. Uh, I think for us, radiation operator safety is an issue. I think it would be nice to put some that is long, just keep a little hub there, fix that on the skin, and now you're working all the way from downhill. You don't have to be working too, too close to the yeah, but moving the sheath and bleeding it around it's a big deal because of the motion so that's no, the no one question. thing that uh tcar did a good job on fixating that nearby very good um how are we doing with time probably done uh, we're always late so yeah 47 year old with left visual field deficit uh nih2 at 6.30 p.m., did get TPA, and um, again, deficits were homonymous hemianopsia, so couldn't see on one side. And um, on the imaging, you can see that there's a P2 occlusion, uh, and here's a perfusion deficit. Well, how would you guys manage this patient? What, what was the time, sorry? Uh, it was um, 6.30, so um, about two and a half hours from onset. Okay, and this person received TPA it and did, it's still he, occluded? Uh, yeah, well, we received TPA, but nothing changed immediately after she, she got TPA. Yeah, it, it, I, I would, I would uh, make my decision based also on the occupation and the age of the patient is just too much for me now to digest uh, <laughs> if it's a 47 year old lorry driver right? no that's great uh, yeah that's that would in, in fact i'm i'm serious so, so i'm just gonna move through this case 47 year old relatively young she was not a driver i can't remember her occupation um she did receive tpa uh, uh, nothing else and then uh, this is a stroke I do want to, since you mentioned that, I do want to go to this uh, case. Uh, again, same thing, 46-year-old uh, with, um, uh, again, hemonymous hemianopsia, and of 2 received TPA. So similar case, similar age. This patient, I believe, was a truck, huh? Was a truck driver. It's, it's always <laughs> a truck driver, yeah. <laughs> and there's the occlusion right here. <laughs> no, it's, it's a clear truck driver image. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, the question is, what do you do with this clot? Both patients did get TPA. The first one, uh, nothing else was done. The patient did have a stroke. Uh, so what would you do with this? Probably do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, because it's so much depends on it for, for this person. Um, I'm showing you the images. I mean, I think it's still a P2. Do you guys agree? Both images, both patients had a P2 occlusion. Um, so this patient um, uh, did go under a uh, thrombectomy. This is the uh, uh, cerebral angio. You can see that there's a blockage right there where the area is and um, underwent reperfusion, successful reperfusion. And um, the patient's stroke is very small and I, I believe he's back to his truck driving. <laughs> so this one, do you go, do you use uh, what the setup to go up there? Uh, Doc, to be, uh, Dr. Hanel, you want to take that? Uh, I think I use a uh, solitaire and I don't deploy the whole thing. I just make sure I'm clovering the clot uh, because again, stent retrievers now are very long for this. I think you're going to make sure not avulsing a branch there. So just partial deployment of a stent retriever and I mean, retract with that. And I think the aspiration catheter was on the mid basilar. Okay, so that's it. it's because the issue here is that can you spread this clot all over the circulation as you're trying to pull it out, right? Because you're making now this little depth into. So you, yeah, that's inter exactly the discussion yeah. here. Yeah, it's a is, is this is a disabling stroke? What is the complication rate that you're exposing to yeah. this patient? That was our internal discussion. So in an off-label domain, where we are, domain where right, this is a, not a, something we know is the best thing. But let's say if we decide to go for intervention, the think the technique, the mechanotomy technique has to be thought out in a way to minimize the risk. And and maybe today would be you can go with the largest aspiration catheter. You likely want to wedge this as close to the clot as possible. I'm thinking with a smaller, perhaps, aspiration catheter. I'm just wondering if that would be a better technique. Then try to bring the clot to the basilar and then aspirate there. Uh, would that be make any, you know, and, or how much flow reversal by having a balloon guide in the, in the vertebral artery and turning on flow reversal from there and try to bring the flow, you know, backwards in the basilar for a period of time. If that, uh, we've seen this in the in vitro, that can happen depending how much aspiration you're starting, how high is yeah. your balloon in the vert. Yeah, he has co-dominant yes, yeah, co yeah. verts. I didn't think there was a... Actually, in the model, it was impressed with particles. We could see the reverse. So, but uh, that's why... But it's really hard to bring the balloon as high up as you need to have that kind of uh, power. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, these are the two considerations. The, how far you go with intermediate cat aspiration and, or if you do balloon aspiration anyway, it, knowing the vert on the other side. Are we going to have a trial for that, Greg? Again, that was a Zach Eric's point when we discussed this case. Again, it's, uh, it's something that a patient has to be aware of. Anopia in itself, uh, you know, it's quite complicated. Uh, it's the amount of degree that you could see in continuity. So there's a lot of people with amianopia that could still uh, drive their truck. And it seems like every meeting is the truck driver, which soon will be <laughs> not even a good example because all those trucks will be uh, self-driven. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and you guys should have heard about the truck driver who decided after that to become an MBA and became CEO of really you know, good company, good, good company <laughs> because he was unable to drive his truck again. So I think this is always the example that feel like, oh, we need to go. But on the flip side, again, the consequence of that could be devastating. And a lot of time because of the angle in the P1, when you pull those clot, I mean, you, you, you change the, the regional anatomy and the perforator, they are quite fragile. So... Um, uh, we've got to remember that in 2013, we also said that thrombectomy didn't work. So I think we've got to keep an open mind and a concept. And I, again, that's what I love about stroke. We're going to have a clinical trial. That's why I asked Greg specifically. I don't know what is the right answer for this, but uh, for the regular Jacksonville hemanoptic patient, that's disabling. We don't have bus system. This guy is, is stuck. If you don't have a car in the city, you're stuck. So we, we all know that. So. But I, I don't disagree with you. We discussed this before. I think it's... Uh, uh, yeah, we're actually uh, publishing um, a, a retrospective of PC occlusion. So uh, we'll work on that. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody.